In 1953, a racing oval was built in the Soviet Union, in Alma Ata. The world began to hear of remarkable times in speed skating. The times produced at this exquisite track were an indication the Soviets would become a major force in world speed skating. In ladies speed skating, Scandinavian countries had dominated. Lila Shue Nilsson of Norway, before the Second World War. And again, Verna Lesch of Finland, uniting her 1939 World All-Around Championship with another, eight years later, in 1947. Verna Lesh's pre- and post-war performances were truly satisfying. So I started with world record and I stopped with the world record uh, at the last championship. So, so I have a good feeling that I was still at the top. <laughs> the next year, it was Maria Izakova of the Soviet Union who won the all-around title. Koshanakova was second. In 1955, Rima Zakova became the world all-around title holder. Maria Izakova was a three-time all-around champion. She represents the powerful force of the Soviet ladies during the 1950s. Men from the Soviet Union made their mark a short time later. Their total domination was delayed because of an outstanding athlete from Norway, Hjalmar Andersen. He speaks of training conditions at the time. I'd say in four and five, days in a week and uh, two and three hours each time. I think that was enough. Um, but we have, we have not the same um, uh, trainers, you know, today they have professional trainers. But not, uh, the, uh, then we ask that time, they, they can't uh, tell us maybe what the, the, the last champion has seen, but, but not another. This is one of Hjalmar Andersen's most famous races, 10,000 meters, full of high drama, the longest 10,000 ever skated. And I also remember a special European championship in Bislett, that a, a flash from a photograph uh, was the reason for I fall and I must go again 10,000 meters. Anderson had completed nearly 8,000 meters when the flash bulb exploded. He tried to continue, but found problems with his skate blade. Meanwhile, his opponent finished the original race. First the 8,000, and I must find another skate, and then I was a new 10,000 meter. Uh, so that's the, the, they talk always about that, the special race that time. It was almost dark when Anderson started the race again, skating the most difficult way, on his own against the clock. When he finished, it was dark. And he was the winner. The famous Klaus Thunberg attended the 1952 Olympic Games in Oslo, where Helmar Andersen would win three gold medals. Again, it was a 10,000 meter race, which provided an extraordinary happening. Anderson was paired with a Japanese skater, Kasahiko Sugawara.
Yalmar Anderson appeared in his first world championships in Oslo in 1949. He was the all-around world champion in 1951 and 1952 and continued to race until 1956. But his moment was at his home track in Bislett. Anderson, during his career, set a world record in 5,000 in 1951, but his race was the 10,000. He first set the record in 1949 and subsequently beat it twice. In this race, something unprecedented. Anderson caught and lapped his opponent. gold medal race for Helmar Anderson. And with royalty looking on, Helmar embraced his well-beaten opponent. Norwegians claim, and rightly so, Bislett Stadium was one of the finest speed skating ovals in the world. Norwegians were and are passionate about speed skating. A big fan of Bislett, Dutch world and Olympic champion, Ard Schenk. To compete, uh, Bislett is, uh, is always uh, a favorite sta uh, stadium because the crowd, and it's, uh, the crowd is so tied to the, to the ice rink and the ice preparation was always perfect. They had, they, they sprayed the uh, ice, not down, but uh, up, and then the water was coming down like raindrops. And you all have these little uh, rounds, and you had a, a tremendous grip. And uh, yeah, well, I liked it. It was very, very nice uh, competing there. Another famous and unique speed skating track was constructed especially for the 1956 Olympic Winter Games in Italy. Where the speed skating was on the lake in Misurina. To have a perfect surface of the lake, the track was uh, cut in the ice of the lake and watered and was a floating ice rink. We had water all around and the, every morning the soldiers had to put out the ice that has been grown during the night. In that case, we had a perfect flat uh, part of the, uh, of the lake and we had very, very good eyes. The big champion at that time was Mr. Grishin from uh, USSR and Mr. Grishin beat the world record of 500 meters in uh, Missouri. Evgeny Grishin was one of the accomplished Soviet skaters who proved that times from Alma Ata were not myth. Others included stylist Boris Shilkov and the man with the powerful legs, Oleg Goncharenko. Soviet skaters, ladies and men, once they entered International Skating Union events, proved mighty competitors through World, European, Sprint, and Junior World Championships, they have won since 1948 more than 180 medals, including 57 gold, a number which surpasses even Norway, which during the 100 years has 145 medals, 52 of which are gold. By 1956, China, and then Spain entered the International Skating Union world. And in 1957, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea joined. James Koch oversaw the union for 15 years. And during his tenure, the International Skating Union embraced a new discipline in figure skating. Ice dancing became official in 1952 in Paris. 
The history of ballroom dancing on ice predates 1952. In England, during the 1930s and 1940s, it was a rage. The thing I remember about the ice dancing in those days was that it was all so much more carefree and had a spontaneity. It wasn't until 1948 with the conference on the standardization of dances for international competition that the steps became written down or became set pattern. The early free dances were more like mini pairs. Whether pairs or dance, the relationship of the partners is important. Everyone knows such alliances are not always smooth sailing. We were practicing and we had a flaming row, you know. We really weren't getting on at all. And um, I, I, I pulled her hand at the same time she pulled away and there was an almighty crack. And this was during the practice, and we were competing the following, the following day. And uh, unfortunately, um, I suppose I broke her wrist. <laughs> so I, you can laugh now. I mean, it was horrific at the time because the following day, here we were going to skate in a in a world championship, and um, she had to have it in plaster. And we skated the championship with her hand in plaster, and we made it. They certainly did make it. Lawrence Demi and Gene Westwood won four consecutive World Ice Dance Championships. To provide the idea of how style changes, here is Courtney Jones. There was a concept of a free dance in those days. Everybody used organ music without exception all over the world. Their music was always recorded by Douglas Walker at Nottingham Ice Stadium, and it was the accepted thing that they had three pieces of music. They had a fast one, a slow one, and a fast one to finish, and that was it. There was just no breaking that mold. And when I first started with June Markham, that was also our mold. But being a bit bolshy, uh, we did break that mold. When I first started with June Markham, she was a highly established solo skater, but she never had anything in her mind except the fact she was a winner. It didn't matter what it was, a European champion, a world champion, she was going to win. There was, no, there was no second best for her. And I think I learned an enormous amount from her. And when the partnership uh, broke up and she turned professional, I basically gave up. I was not going on. And it was Miss Hogg who persuaded me to go on with this new partner, Dorian, where the position was reversed. I was the world champion, and she was a very capable free skater, but actually had never danced in a dance championship in her life. She was the most fantastic partner. She was always happy. She would, she would never be down. Courtney Jones won four world championships, two with June Markham, two with Doreen Denny. Jones and Denny were followed by this couple from Czechoslovakia, four times world champions from 1962 through 1965.
The Czechoslovakians were followed by an innovative and fast skating couple from Great Britain. Diane Tower and Bernard Ford also won four world championships, 1966 through 1969. Relationships between the Soviet Union and the Western world were tenuous politically. Nevertheless, a surprising connection was made athletically and artistically. Here, once again, Muriel K. Fulton. They had never had the discipline of ice dancing. They had solo skating and some pair skating. This was new. So they had asked Reg Wilkie, who at that time was the chairman of the Ice Dance Committee of the International Skating Union, would they be allowed to translate my book? So they used the book, and apparently it was very successful because they went into a second edition. I had emphasized rhythm in ice dancing, integrity of technique and flow, and all of their ice dancers, particularly in the early days, did exactly just that. Pakamova was a fantastic personality and a, and a wonderful athlete. She could have done anything. She could have been an actress, she could have been a bareback rider at a circus. She could have done absolutely anything in an athletic way. Uh, very bright, bags of personality. And uh, she, she lifted the, the dancing and it's one of the reasons that I think that Jacques Favar in those days was able to persuade the Olympic people to put it as the uh, debut in the Olympics in, in 1976 in Innsbruck. This couple provided an image of ice dance which went beyond the ballroom. All Soviet ice dancers were supported by several remarkable teachers and choreographers. Elena Chekhovskaya, Tatiana Tarasova, and Natalia Dubova. And then along came a young English couple. I suppose one of the uh, our big changes was from 81 to 82 that uh, we took a single piece of music and made it thematic. Um, an idea which was, uh, we called it the Mac and Mabel piece. And the idea of it that we, we sort of characterized um, the Mac Senna and Mabel Norman characters and, and then the silent movies on the screen, we'd sort of taken an essence and trying to put it all together. It, it wasn't just movement to music, which a lot of people tend to do.
The performance was so special. It and the bevy of sixes they obtained for it still reverberate through figure skating. It was once said that to experience the skating, whether outdoors or inside an arena, a person had to be at the competition. Television changed that perception. The first European television broadcast was in 1957 by the British Broadcasting Corporation. I think it was the European or World Championships of 1957 um, were transmitted live, of course. There was very little recording in those days, and Alan Weeks was the commentator. The broadcasts, of course, would only be about half an hour long. Uh, and then he had to say, and now I'm afraid it is the moment when the ice is being resurfaced. So we had 20 minutes of men scraping the ice with uh, scrapers and brushes and hose pipes playing to put uh, uh, a water surface on, and uh, the half hour broadcast was 10 minutes skating and 20 minutes of uh, ice resurfacing. Regardless, television has become a major player in the history of skating, and the man who knows is ISU General Secretary Beat Hostler. Today, you can make a lot of money with our events in speed and figure skating. I think today is a big business. If I remember, I think the first contract sold to American TV was $5,000, and everybody was proud to get this money, and today, probably get five million dollars for the same. So that's a big change in, big change. I would say, in 30 years. Television rights are held by major companies in Japan, Korea, and Australia, in Europe, Canada, and the United States. The first North American broadcast of skating came from the 1960 Squaw Valley Olympic Winter Games. Whereas figure skating has readily embraced television around the world, speed skating has had a tentative relationship with the medium, except in the Netherlands and Norway. In the 1950s, in the 1960s, speed skating was very popular in Norway. And when you had the big, big competitions, it was always crowded with 25,000 spectators every day. Then came the television. And a lot of people, they preferred to stay at home to watch television. They didn't lose their interest in speed skating, but they preferred to stay at home and uh, denied to stay outside then where it often could be very cold, sometimes 20 below. In the Netherlands, a slightly different story. Everybody here in Holland is, is sitting with a, with, a, with a sheet of paper on his knee and writing down all the uh, intermedial times and all the differences. And if you as a commentator forget to, to mention one intermedial time, you've got a lot of letters and telephones because they are looking down to write down on the knee so they can't look at the screen, you know, and they, do, they don't see the time. The time is on the screen, so somebody else says, why do you always always call about these times we can see that on the screen no when are you writing you can't see them and i have to tell that's, that's the problem it's ridiculous meanwhile the soviets used cameras to assist their speed skating training techniques ard Schenk noticed they filmed hundreds of, uh, of, of kilometers uh, of film from case from me uh, also from from the norwegian but there was always one man which was only was filming during european and world championships and other uh, competitions that was true, and Soviet women continued to dominate the ladies' speed skating races. Tamara Rilova was the all-around champion in 1959, her only world victory. She was second four times, third twice.
Tamara Rolova. Valentina Stanina, three times an all-around champion. But in many ways, mainly because of the heavy media attention accorded the Olympic Games, a Soviet teacher from the Urals made it possible for the world to learn of the splendid Soviet lady skaters. Lydia Skoblakova, a gold medalist at Squaw Valley, and in Innsbruck, four years later, a four-time winner. When Tatiana Avarina came on the world scene, she became the extension of a significant tradition of Soviet lady skaters, all-around champion in 1978. 11 world records in individual races. But between Skoblakova and Avarina came a fine skater from the Netherlands whose training methods differed from the Soviets. I had a book for, of uh, Klaas Thunberg uh, that was a Finnish uh, skater and there was an, uh, yes, uh, when uh, page with uh, with training methods and then I did that and then I was uh, walking fast for, for two kilometers but uh, uh, without warming up and then uh, I, I went in into a hot uh, bath bath and then um, uh, rest for uh, for a quarter <laughs> that was all. <laughs> After a disappointing Olympics in 1968, Kaiser vowed to stay for another Games. The two-time world all-around champion, considered old for her sport, made a triumph of spirit with a gold in the 3,000 meters at Sapporo. A teammate of Bas Kaiser was Acha Kulin Dilstra, who won four all around world championships in five years. Speed skating has no event to remotely resemble the pairs of figure skating. The first world pair champions were from Germany in 1908. This couple won the world title three times. Austrians Helene Engelmann and Alfred Berger were top rivals for the Jacobsons. Helene Engelmann. 1924 hatte ich einen neuen Partner, Alfred Berger, auch ein Sololäufer war er, aber nicht gar so hervorragend und äh, Jakobsons haben uns getroffen bei der ersten Weltmeisterschaft nach dem ersten Weltkrieg 1922 in Davos und da war sie sehr aufgeregt, Jakobson, und hatte sich immer sehr mockiert über unsere Sprünge, wir waren das erste Paar, was eine Hebefigur hatte und da hat sie schon immer gesagt, das ist ja kein Paarlaufen, das ist ja Akrobatik. From France, the Brunets introduced strong solo skating to pairs. This pair was twice Olympic champions, four times World Pairs title holders. Ernst Bayer was a modernist, advocating skating purity. Herber and Bayer may not have been advanced in jump technique, but their skating would shine today.
lifting is not allowed if you lift your one partner by your power in the air. It was not allowed. So we had, we lifted too, but we didn't make uh, acrobatic out of it. Herber and Beyer made a film of their skating, an art film. Maxie Herber had some words to say about her partner. He was very strict. He was very hard. He was never satisfied. Ernst was very, is very ambitious. And uh, he didn't make any difference of uh, Olympics or not. Only that uh, we were under some pressure because uh, the people expected that we should win. So this was a pressure. By the mid-1950s, pairs began to become more acrobatic. Sheldon Galbraith coached Defoe and Bowden. They were good enough to change pair skating. And they brought in the throws, carries, and they brought in syncopation. They brought in choreographic moves that had not been seen before. And the first records in pairs that were continuous. They brought an overhead that stopped on the shoulder. They did the throw three jump, in which uh, Murray would swing Franny about himself into a giant three jump and go into a spread eagle and then pivot. She would come and jump into his arms. All these were theatrical moves under their standards, but what used to be called theatrical is now accepted norm in skating today. Defoe and Bowden were followed by Barbara Wagner and Robert Paul, also coached by Sheldon Galbraith. They were better yet, but they had the benefit of training under Nori and Franny as ideals. And they worked outside with them too in the early stages. Now we were doing all outdoor championships at that time, but the two of them wanted to skate singles. I put them together as a pair to strengthen the weakness of one and draw upon Barbara's uh, vivacity and uh, her personal nature of outgoing. And Bob was quite introverted at the time, very talented fellow. But he was, he was jumping the wrong way for his greatest development. He was jumping to the left and he's natural to the right. So I developed both sides for him. But as I say, I asked him to develop it. This guy, one of the first fellows to beat double axles both ways. All double jumps he could do both ways. The next great pair was Oleg Potopopov and Lyudmila Belosova. I began to skate very old. I was 16 years old. And um, why I began to skate? Because I dreamed when I was a child, I dreamed to be a ballerina. But uh, during the war, it wasn't possible. And when uh, we moved to Moscow, my father worked in Moscow. I saw a movie. Uh, it calls uh, Serenade Solnchen. Snow Serenade. Snow Serenade. With Yeva Pavlik, uh, Austrian uh, figure skater. And uh, I thought, oh, maybe I'll try. Ludmila and Oleg were a dedicated couple who won four world championships and Olympic gold in 1964 and 1968. Look at the lean she gets on this.
everything that they do is in per perfect control. And every move that they make has been thought out in advance. That's why they're champions. Now look at this lift. Look at that. Beautiful. The Protopopovs made a drama of partings and reunions. There was an exquisite simplicity, easy to look at, difficult to achieve. When we were prepared, uh, preparing uh, to the Olympic Games uh, of 1964, we um, decided to reduce half of elements from this program. And that is why this program won the medal. Their legacy is the memory and these spirals. Another great Soviet pair skater, Irina Rodnina, expresses her feelings about the skating of the Protopopovs. In skating, they was for me like God, because I think uh, they changed my mind about pair skating. How? They begin skates, do it. In ballet, say do it. Two people and one mind and one feeling. And before, skates pair and uh, in skating because in life he's much different. <laughs> Irina Rodnina won her first world and Olympic titles skating with Alexei Ulanov. Then she paired with Alexander Zaitsev and had a dream in Bratislava. One day before I have dream and in this dream music stop. <laughs> and stop us in the same place, in the same... I was ready for the next day when music stopped. I was ready, it's very fun. This is what happened in only their second competition, the Worlds of 1973. Well, the music has broken down, but they are keeping on with their program, and this is another unprecedented occasion. I, can, I can't remember during my time in skating that skaters have carried on when their music has stopped, but they are going on. Well, they're going through with this, and they're really skating extraordinarily well. Everything they're doing is coming off. The crowd are absolutely roaring them on, and they've gone now, and there's only five seconds over. What a roar! What a cheer! Emotion from Arena. In 1980, the end of a career of 10 world championships and three Olympic golds. From the Protopopovs onwards, Soviet pair skaters were the best in the world. This pair, four-time world champions and Olympic gold medalists in 1988, represents the epitome of a tradition.
Following World War II and after the triumphs of Dick Button came a spate of remarkable men figure skaters from the United States. Hayes Allen Jenkins, suave and stylish, a champion 1953 to 1956, an Olympic champion in 1956. Hayes' brother, David Jenkins, more athletic, incredibly musical, the champion in 1957, 58, and 59, Olympic champion in 1960. There was the gifted Ronnie Robertson, arguably the best spinner in the history of figure skating. American ladies of the time were also superb. Carol Heiss, fast, sporty, feminine, a five-time world champion and Olympic champion in 1960. Tenley Albright, a contrast to Carol Heiss, regal, artistic, an original, and a world champion in 1953 and 55, Olympic champion 1956. United States supremacy ended in February 1961 with a plane crash in Belgium. Among the passengers killed, this mother and her two daughters. Maribel Vincent Owen, Laurence Owen, and Sister Maribel. Laurence Owen was the newly crowned ladies champion of the United States. The decade of the 60s was rebuilding time for the United States. One decade later, this skater was part of the new generation, Janet Lynn. The skating resemblance to Lawrence Owen is uncanny. By date alone, however, it was Peggy Fleming who symbolized the United States' recovery. Peggy Fleming brought the look of a ballerina to skating, precise, upright, aloof, the image of the ideal, three-time world champion and Olympic gold medalist, 1968. 